Good evening. Welcome to the Central and Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, October 5th. And uh, hold on one second. Are you going to, are you pulling up the agenda, Jeff, or? Sure. Um, oh, you know, that's right. I'll, I've got it right on my phone too. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll start while you're pulling that up. <clears throat> Oh, there we go. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for coming tonight or tuning in. <clears throat> um, tonight we've got our minutes to approve. We've got an update from the town clerk on the upcoming election. We've got an update from uh, our schools. We've got the, the superintendent and we've got Ben, a principal over at the elementary school. We've got participation COVID regional micro enterprise assistance program on there. We've got Municipal electricity supply contract. We usually talk about that around this time of year. And then we've got our um, usual COVID-19 state of emergency update. We've got licensing fees, department head scheduling, uh, discussions of benchmarks for employee wage adjustments. That's a placeholder. And we've got uh, any select board and town administrator updates. And we've got I noticed an item out on correspondence for certification of housing production plan. So without further ado, I'll hop into the minutes. Um, do we have a motion on the minutes from the last meeting of September 28th? I'll make that motion. All right. Is that a second then, Tom? Yeah. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, September 28th minutes? Aye. Aye. We have three to zero on that. And do you um, are you ready, or do you want? Do you need a few more? Minutes? Okay, here. I will slide oh, out sure. of the way, and you can have my chair. And, I was going to give that to Tom, but I'll do it to right. And I like to present our town clerk, Wendy, who's going to talk about. She's got an arm full of ballots, ballots. and she's going to talk about the um, upcoming election process. And I know, just uh, I'll just say real quick that um, despite some of the information that has been put out there, you all know what goes on in our elections and how organized they are. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're uh, voting. All right. All right. So um, everybody has three choices on how to vote. Vote by mail, which requires an application. Um, there will be early voting starting on the 17th and for two weeks. And then there's voting on the day of the election. I will say um, the, there will not be as many voting booths due to COVID-19. So uh, you should, if you're going to vote on election day, either plan to wait or try to go at an off time. Uh, today, the ballots just came in, so Yay! that we've been working to um, get the ballots out. I, not all the ballots are done because uh, we ran out of envelopes, so we are waiting for the, have to wait for the state to send us more. We just use what we got in the shipment today. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, there is a sample ballot. The ballot is two sides, so everybody should remember to flip it over. It does say on there to vote on two sides. Um, a tracking your ballot if you're voting by mail is a good thing to do. If you notice that one hasn't been sent to you, then you should con contact me. Um, of course, they're just going out today and tomorrow. So if you don't get one by next week, then you should contact me so that we can figure out what happened and why you don't have one. Um, the same thing as returning, you know, towards closer to the election. If you see that I haven't received one, if you did it by mail, then calling me is, is a good thing because then you can come in and vote and make sure that your vote is counted. Um, we do have, what David just gave me, the red book everybody should have received in the mail. There's also a link on the website um, that has that. If you're voting on election day, it's a real good idea to fill out this page. It's kind of like a cheat sheet and it will save you time in the voting booth. You just have to remember to take it with you. 
And um, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Anybody has any questions? Oh, David did have a question. When you do the vote by mail, you'll get it like this. Um, and then there's also an inside envelope. Your ballot has to go inside that envelope and seal it. Um, if that envelope doesn't come back, then your ballot will be rejected. So make sure you sign it is the most important thing, signing it. And um, there's only three things you have to fill out. Sign your name, print your name, and put your address. And seal it, and then you'll put it in this white envelope. And you can either drop it in. Sunderland has a new drop box in the back of the building, which is great. It's big. It will, it's secure. It will hold a whole bunch of ballots. And um, that's, that's a good way to know that we received it. I have a question. Somebody just um, sent in the ballot and wonder if you've got it. Uh, some people have been telling people to go to the polls election day, which is probably not the best thing to check and see if you got it, right? No, on our website, if you go to our website and at the bottom of the main page, it says voting information. If you click that, um, you can get a vote by mail application. You can track your ballot and tracking your ballot um, let you know when I sent the ballot out. And um, I don't know, are, can you do this for me, Jeff? If you track your ballot, uh, we could use, um, Scott or Tom, do you mind if we use one of your names? No, go ahead, it's fine. Oh, okay, so either one. And Scott, are you seven old Amherst? Correct. Okay, so on, on there, it will say that his ballot got sent today. It didn't get sent till like 4.45, but it got sent today. Um, and then he can come back and see when I received it. So then he'll know. And it will also say that it's accepted or say, for instance, he didn't put it in the envelope and sign it. It would be rejected and it would let him know why it was rejected. Although I, I do call people and let them know before the election if it's rejected. Any other questions? Polling place? Polling place is at the library. Um, David Grace um, will put a sign up at the elementary school again. To, so if anybody gets confused, we'll let them know that it's at the library. It's from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Nice. And then if you look down further on this, you can see the hours for early voting. And early voting is here, if I could, Mr. Chair, in the town office building by appointment? Nope, during regular pre-COVID hours, but we're adding a few hours on Saturday and Sunday and the last Friday, but not the 23rd. So if, I, if I could, Mr. Chair, what was the, Madam Clerk, what was the volume on the primaries? Were people really excited about this new changes and how did it go? I think most people were. Uh, I think it was confusing to some people when they got the applications in the mail. They thought that was the only way. So we did have people change their mind and vote in person. And we've had that now where people have decided that they want to come in and vote, whether it's early voting or on election day. They can, they can yep, races. you go park in the back of the building and you go through, um, you'll vote in my office and then you'll exit out the front door. Nice. And I read in the Globe today where um, Mr. Galvin said there was 1.6 million votes cast in the cast in the primary, and they expect that to be more in the general election. I, I haven't counted our total numbers, but I believe we've doubled. Yeah, I believe I'm sending over a thousand ballots out. 
now. Wow. Um, um, it would have been nice though. It's it's late. Um, I've been so nervous about because I think we're getting ballots out late. Uh, October fifth only gives a month, less than a month, um, for ballots to come back to people who are not in Sunderland. Is is tough. Great point. So, um, but other than that, I, it's. It's, uh, they're starting where it's, they're going out. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I think as you can see, uh, based on what we showed, things are pretty organized in the uh, voting department. You'll just probably want to get your, try to get your ballots in as soon as possible, just to leave a nice buffer. Um, you can go out to the website or you can call. Um, if you Remember, if you're trying to check the status, please don't show up at the polls to check your status. There's two easy ways to do it, online or by a telephone call. All right, you actually could talk, pop in to make an appointment and see Wendy too. So you got three ways to do that. And then like Wendy mentioned, just remember when you're sending your ballot back to put the ballot in the yellow, smaller yellow envelope, and then put that in the larger white envelope because um, it won't be counted if that's not uh, correct. And that's a security envelope inside the other envelope. So they're not doing that just to make you put things. It's not a, a little rush, Russian nesting doll of envelopes. Well, I probably shouldn't describe it that way, but <laughs> so <laughs> now that I think about it, but so just remember to do that, folks, because. Um, there were some issues in Pennsylvania and some confusion. They had the same situation there. So just remember to do that. And if you have any questions, uh, give Wendy a buzz. She'd be glad to help you out there. So, and she's been very busy. Uh, I see her bustling around with all her envelopes and everything. So I appreciate that update and every, all the hard work that everybody here has been helping out to uh, get that done. And now on next on our agenda, we've got, um, Darius Modesto, the superintendent, and we've got uh, Ben Barshavsky, the principal of the elementary school. I'm not sure which one of you guys wants to go first, but. Um, I'll go first. We did rock, paper, scissor earlier and you lost. Uh, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, well, yeah, you thanks jump for inviting for it, us. Huh? That's right. <laughs> no jump balls? <laughs> no jump balls, no, uh, not these days. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for inviting us. Um, yeah, update from the elementary school. Uh, first, I wanna give a big thank you to the teaching staff uh, of the school. They spent last spring and all summer long preparing for the start of the school year. They served on various committees over the summer months. Um, additionally, this year, which was a big change from years past, we had 10 days of professional development starting from Wednesday, uh, August, August 26th to um, Wednesday, September 9th, and those 10 days of PD were spent preparing for the school year. So they were active participants in workshops and, and really did so much just to get the school year starting. Leading up to the start of school, we held three separate family informational sessions for parents and guardians. We also held a student informational session where students could log in and ask questions to our staff. And additionally, we held a technology informational session session with our library media specialist, Rachel Kidder, leading up on this. These are all held leading up to the school year. So what does school year look like? A uh, big change from this year to years past is there's a lot of outdoor learning taking place. Clipboards, camping chairs, event tents um, are all showcased as part of our in-person learning program this fall. We are also working with our technology department to set up Wi-Fi access points outside so that students can use their devices at the seven tents that we have set up on our six tents, seven tents set up on our school, school grounds. Additionally, uh, we received some community donations. The Sunderland Elementary School community regularly reaches out to the school for support. And towards the end of the summer, the Sunderland Women's Club generously donated over 330 hand-sewn cloth masks that can be shapes, sizes, and designs. And they also do donated close to 150 procedural masks. I'd like to publicly recognize uh, this incredibly kind gesture from the club 
and uh, give them a heartfelt thank you on behalf of the students and staff of Sunderland Elementary School. Additionally, we received an extremely large monetary donation from a Sunderland business. Uh, this is a silent partner of ours that supported our school in many ways over the years. And we thank them for their doma donation as the money will go directly towards student programming. I mentioned the, um, the 10 days of PD. On September 10th and 11th, those were remote days. The first two days of school were remote days. And then starting the week of Monday, September 14th, we've started bringing students back into the building. Uh, we started with our most vulnerable learners and our preschool students. Then the week of the 21st, we brought in another wave of students. And then finally, this past, last week, we were able to welcome all of the students whose families did sign up for the hybrid model. The hybrid model uh, features two cohorts, A cohort and B cohort. A is there on Mondays and Thursdays. B is there on Tuesdays and Fridays. Wednesday is a remote day for everyone. And then uh, some of our kiddos are there for four days during the week. Um, and that's for different reasons, uh, lack of internet access at home. The remote learning platform uh, isn't suitable to, towards their uh, learning needs and a, and a few other reasons as well. And then today was actually the first day of full day instruction for, for everyone. So it's, it's off to a great start. Our, uh, our families have been very, very patient as we're working through some technology issues that are obviously going to be coming up. And we appreciate their support and flexibility that they've uh, shown towards us. So all in all, it's been a very good and, and positive start to the school year. We have around 55% of our students in the hybrid model and another 45 choosing remote. So any questions for, for me about what's happening at the elementary school? Just, just let you know, Ben, if you need anything from us, let us know, okay? Great, yes, thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, and um, I, I can say from, from talking to some others, we're, we're very lucky that we uh, we have the administration that we do because um, there there are some other there's some other districts that I know that are very that are struggling right still, and and you guys seem to get you know every everything from buying PPE um, right. it seems like you guys are you got that handled well, um, and and the, I would have thought that was a little thing or or just like cleaning supplies they can't get cleaning supplies right now. Um, so I think that you, you, the administration has done a great job right now and the support that it's given its uh, faculty and staff. And again, it's important that the kids learn, but that faculty and staff have to be put in a position so they can learn. So thank you guys for doing a great job. Thanks, Tom. So could I ask, Mr. Chair? Yeah. What are the triggers for a reversal or an adaptation in the policy? We're seeing that around uh, locally, and we're seeing it nationally. Sure, Good Darius. Question. Do you, do you want to speak sure. to the uh, the health metrics? Yeah, you can be the the guy with all the good news. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so we have a we have a series of uh, of health metrics that you know, we presented. Um, and look at Jessica threw it in there. Hey, um, so you can very nice, Jessica. Thank you. Um, that can kind of that shows what the 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 point is of um, if the numbers rise. Um, wow, even sharing the screen, it's even nice better. <laughs> nice. Technology, huh? <laughs> and so basically, you know, you're looking at your there's different ones that the state is saying, and so we developed this. This is where this is where it's, it was frustrating. It was a very long August. Um, for all the school community members and for the, I guess, the school community, so to speak, because we were putting together these metrics before the states came out with metrics. You know what I mean? And we were stealing ideas that were creeping out at the time. So, you know, we have several different, um, you know, metrics that we look at. Um, the state really wants us to go off the, you know, what it's, what it's putting out on the state uh, dashboard page. Um, there's also a Franklin County page as well, uh, or Western Mass page, which Franklin County gets broken out into. Um, so we're looking at all these things, but I'll be honest with you, the, the real thing we're going to be looking at is, um, you know, we, we're working closely with the Board of Health. You know, I was, on, I was on the phone with Caitlin Rock 
um, even last Friday, as we were, you know, or was it Thursday, as we were just looking at some of the spikes in our neighboring communities and just wondering right. what was the impact in our community. Because um, even though we look at some of these numbers, in order to get to those numbers in our small community, the chances of those numbers getting that high without there being effects in the school, um, I would be very surprised. So um, I think we'd be probably shutting down well before those numbers even get reached within the metrics because the once we get those kind of, uh, any kind of um, impact of the schools, I imagine the Board of Health will be saying we wanna, we wanna close either for a short period of time. Um, the reason why you would do that because you wanna see, um, you wanna make sure you're tracking and where you're tracking um, all the COVID cases are and the Board of Health is doing an excellent job of that. And these are things that weren't in place in the spring. And so what people talk about what's the difference between the spring and now is that there's a much better your tracking system of, you know, when, when cases pop up, doing your tracking of who's been, in, um, who was exposed, who are the possible exposures, and kind of locking down those people um, until they can have tests done um, and confirm that they're um, okay to go. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, that's, you know, basically what I think is the main part of those indicator. You're looking right there is the, the, the on the screen is the, the community level data map. Um, I don't know if that's been updated as of last Wednesday. Um, I, don't know what, I can't read the date, it's too small in there. Um, but they, 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 they kind of basically the states come out, gray is, you know, you're good to go. Green is um, kind of, you know, keep a watch. There you go. Um, full in person or hybrid. The yellow is, you know, looking at hybrid or remote. Um, it, it depends on going, you know, the state is a lot more aggressive than we have been and, and are talking about this with the local boards of health. And then red is saying that you need to go remote if you're in a hybrid situation. So, um, you know, and when you when you look at those numbers through the uh, through the lens of our smaller communities, one you know per hundred thousand, we don't have a hundred thousand in the county. Um, it gets kind of it gets kind of uh, those numbers are kind of skewed in that area. We're really going to be looking at what's happening and working with the board of health about where the cases are, who is it affecting. Um, I think we're going to be doing that well before we reach some of those data indicators. If you go to like slide seven, I think those are the, you know, the <clears throat> start breaking down. Um, they're asking us to look at, you know, 14 days um, in order to trigger. Um, I think if you go to one below that, it, I think it actually breaks down the, what the um, primary indicators are. So, you know, um, eight per day per 100,000. Um, Statewide average, a positive test of 5%. I mean, right now we're at 1.1, I think. And that's, you know, um, and we're saying it's, it's rising, but you're still very far away from that. And then we actually looked at um, 3%, um, you know, at the county level, because our county has, never, has not seen a 5%. If our county saw a 5%, I mean, it would, it'd be, it would be shaking. I think we would be shutting it down. Um, we're working with the Board of Health to figure out, you know, how long we should shut down for that kind of thing. So. You know, in a nutshell, those are the indicators that we're looking at. Um, and there's the judiciary indicators on nine, I believe, slide nine, which has been slightly updated since our, no, these are the secondary rather, um, you know, we're 14 days, 25 for Franklin County, um, excluding, you know, congregate settings, you know, obviously if there's a breakout. There's an unfortunate breakout like in a, in a nursing facility or that kind of thing where it's, 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 it's you know, it's not community spread, basically what's going on there. Um, and then the Franklin County and Hampshire County's 10 cases per day or 70 cases in a week. So that's kind of what we're looking at there. And then the last, the slide 10 is the judiciary, basically where I've been kind of leaning toward that the, the Board of Health is going to basically say, you know, we're seeing certain spread, we're seeing community spread. We need to stop, pause, or we need to shut down for whatever the amount of time would be. None of that is predetermined. It'll all be case by case basis. Based by looking at the numbers and what the, you know, where the numbers are, how they affect the school, um, and what the, you know, supposed um, transmission was. So, and I mean, already we're tracking this, you know, we've been tracking this since we brought kids back in the building. So, I mean, there's cases that are popping up here and there um, that we're tracking to make sure people are tested, and then, you know, what kind of exposure that has had to the building. Um, we've been, you know, like wood here knocking on that, you know, we've been fortunate so far. Um, not to have any, um, you know, cases that have, you know, directly affected our buildings to, you know, look at closure or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, people waiting on test results and that kind of thing is more and more common practice um, as people, you know, may have been exposed or been near someone exposed or they're not feeling well, so they're going to get 
tested. And so I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have as a school is that if you're a staff member, there's no tiling up and powering through. All of a sudden you come down or a student or you know, I don't want to say staff, but you know, you know, it's our staffing issues. Or, you know, we have a lot of staff out, but also students as well. You know, if you're sick, you, you stay home. And if it's something significant, then you, you contact your primary care, primary care physician and get a test. Um, because we just don't know. And that's why we're encouraging and the state is asking for everybody to, you know, get your flu shots. I know we just had the very successful flu um, shot this weekend, um, but it really, you wanna get, you wanna you know, minimize those other flus where you're gonna have to go getting tested for COVID when you have symptoms. So um, yeah, that's kind of overall what the, what the indicators look like. Um, questions on that it's, it's a lot to take in there's a lot of we try to when we develop this again we build out ahead of the state we wanted to have many be looking at all the data not just one map and so when i look at that map the state puts out i say yeah that's just a map the real the real story is when the board of health is getting those is getting those uh they have the access to maven they know exactly who we're talking about you know what i mean if there's a sudden spike in sunderland for some reason is that one household of UMass students, I use that as an example, but you know, we did see the breakout of just UMass students, or is that a household that is, you know, sending students to our schools or um, right. other interactions within the thing? Those are, those are the important factors that the Board of Health has. All right, gonna get down into those details. <clears throat> and just to uh, reiterate a point that you made for the school community, but it's really important for everybody in general, please uh, get your flu shots because you don't want to be the, the uh, symptoms are so similar that it's very difficult to differentiate. So if you could at least eliminate the regular flu from being an issue, that, that'll help everybody out. So that's an important thing. And thanks for all the, all the work you guys have been doing. So it's greatly appreciated. All right, any other questions for uh, Ben or Darius? But thank you for all your work. It's really, really well thought out. And as you said, August was busy. Yeah. Crazy busy. <laughs> right into the fire. <clears throat> all right. Thanks for coming, guys. We appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, guys. You take care. Yeah, all thank right. you. Have a good night. Thanks. All righty. Um, I see our next update is participation in the COVID Regional Micro Enterprise Assistance Program. Do we yeah. lose Jeff? Nope. You there, Jeff? No, yeah. that's right. I muted myself. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, right. So I think we discussed this a, a couple weeks ago. Um, the, some CDBG funds uh, were provided to Greenfield uh, for a countywide micro enterprise grant program. Um, and uh, I learned on a conference call last week or video conference that um, we actually had to opt, each community actually had to opt in with a select board vote um, to participate in the program. And so I just pulled up on the screen, um, just sort of the, the details of the program. They have to have eligible businesses have to have five or fewer employer employees. Um, owner's household income is less than 80% of the HUD median income, for-profit with a physical presence in Franklin County, um, provide goods or services, must be in good standing, basically paying their taxes, licensed registration, um, established prior to January 1st, 2019, um, and annual sales greater than 20,000. Um, and I think when I mentioned it l last time, and again, I think it was a few months ago, it, um, it, it sounded like the, the select board was glad to have a program like this. So um, I can do any additional research, um, but I think this is the first step. And then, uh, then actually uh, businesses in Sunderland who are eligible would, would be able to apply and we wouldn't be holding it up. Um, okay. Yeah, I think anything, anything we can do to help the sm small businesses, especially since they're the 
they represent the bulk of the employment in the economy. That's an important thing. <clears throat> we have any questions on um, on the grant at all, the program at all? So this is administered through the city of Greenfield. Yes. How do we communicate this to the potential participants in Sunderland? Uh, we would put uh, information out on the website. Um, we can uh, ask FCAT to put information up um, the on the local channel. access television. Um, I think that th those are, are the primary methods. Um, okay. I've started talking to some businesses that, that I'm aware of and because of the restriction, the micro enterprise restrictions, um, I haven't found one that's eligible. Okay. Um, but in my conversations, I'll, I'll continue to promote it as well. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Word of mouth can get around pretty quickly too. So that's good. <clears throat> All right. We, um, we have a motion on that recommendation. I think the wording is right down, down below there. Uh, move to participate in the COVID regional microenterprise assistance program as recommended. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. All right. Three to zero on that one. Jeff, thanks. <clears throat> and then next up we've got, which we usually do around this time of year, the municipal electricity supply contract. So uh, about two weeks ago, um, reached out to the Lower Pioneer Valley Education Collaborative, which has done the request for quotes um, in last time, and they came back uh, last week with, with the quotes, and uh, IGS Energy was the lowest, um, provide the lowest quote. Uh, and we can, there are terms of one, two, and three years. Um, here it shows the current price of about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, if we went for a three-year contract, it would be um, about half cent less per kilowatt hour. Um, regardless, it's going to be about a half cent less per kilowatt hour, depending on how long of a contract we wanted to sign last time that the town signed a contract, it was it was a three-year contract. Um, yeah. It includes the uh, standard renewable portfolio of green energy um, required by the state. Okay. And I think the, the one thing to note is that the prices fluctuate. Um, I think the price that we I got last, I think it was Tuesday was about uh, I don't know, a tenth of a cent higher than this is today's prices. So it, it fluctuates on a daily basis. So this might not be the exact price, but um, right. just wanted to mention that. So we lock in the price on the day that we sign it. How, how does that? Exactly. Yep. And like a mortgage. Right. Okay. Hmm. So a little, a little bit of savings from last year, and your recommendation is a full three years, not one? Yes, because I, I think, and this is what, what I learned from, from the discussions in the municipal energy aggregation, is that energy prices are pretty low right now. And the expectation is that over the next couple of years, they'll probably begin to climb back up again. Um, so I think that this is probably a good rate. Um, and if we can lock it in now, uh, that's a good deal. I mean, I, and, and yeah, I think it's based on that and the fact that the town signed a, a three-year agreement last time. Are, are there reservations with a, a three-year contract? No, or? no. I just, I don't, I'm cursed being a Libra. I, I've got to <laughs> do this thing every single time. It's a good, it, it's a good question to ask, though. 
and you said it was the state's uh, the state's portfolio recommendation for renewables. This is in keeping with what town residents may have signed up for with the switch last six months? Yes, the options that uh, residential consumers were offered, uh, I believe had a slightly higher, uh, there was a, a 20 renewable portfolio standard plus a, um, some state uh, renewable energy credits. So and that was uh, that was focused on being a, a local producer of renewables as opposed to a national producer selling credits. Correct. And okay. there was the option to have 100% green energy from a nationwide solution as well, or um, provider. The reason I ask is I want to ensure that the town's going to go out and buy, you know, three year contract for the supplier uh, that we're in keeping with what we asked the what we were asking as part of municipal aggregation. Makes sense. I hate to be the hypocrite. It's a fair ask. Good, thank you, Jeff, I appreciate it. I'll move to, move to recommend a three year buy as, what is it, IGS? Exactly. IGS Energy uh, at the price, uh, the cheapest possible price the procurement officer can get. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead and do a second, Tom. All Thank right, all, all those in favor? Uh, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Um, do you want to also authorize me to execute the contract so that as soon as they send it, I can just, uh, we'll, we'll know the price? Yeah, I'll include that in my motion as long as the price isn't higher than what's printed on this form in front of us. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, three to zero on that one, Jeff. <clears throat> Our oil, we only get one year at a whack. Electricity, yeah. we can get, well, elements of electricity. Remember, we're only buying, in this case here, the, the uh, generator. We're not buying distribution. So we're only buying a portion of our energy portfolio on a three-year contract. That's right. <clears throat> And the last time I checked last week, I think oil was still under $50 a barrel. So, <clears throat> all right, I'm just getting my calisthenics in here as I uh, <laughs> get the lights on. So you'll period, I'm doing jumping jacks periodically. <laughs> all right, and um, now we're getting down. I see Laurie lit up on the screen there. Hey, EMD. For our, for our COVID Hello. update. Yes. Um, I was notified last Tuesday that we do have another positive case in Sunderland. So I notified the chief of police and the fire chief and then had a question sort of for Cheryl and her response back was kind of interesting. Um, she texted both Butch and I to say with the return of students and too much testing, we will now begin to have a percentage of false positives. Hmm. Um, we know this because recent history of negative tests, cases are asymptomatic and they have no known exposure to COVID within the last 14 days. So, you know, I haven't heard back from her. I don't think, unless they have a retest and it comes back negative, I'm not sure how we'll be able to catch that. But right now, where she's reporting positive cases to us. I was actually just wondering that, like, what's the protocol? If let's say you test positive, are you, rec does it recommend that you go get another test again just to prevent that or? I do not know. Mm, okay. I could certainly ask Cheryl. Yeah. So a, po a positive test is simply go into the quarantine isolation modes. Uh, to, David, to David's question, you know, if, if you were, adamant if, if if i'm adamant about it saying listen i haven't left my house in 14 days how is it even remotely possible do i go back and get another test and then go aha mm -hmm. interesting and i assume the answer is yes to that i yep. mean just got to sort of look at the news right now and see what's going on sure right. yeah that is that's interesting <clears throat> great point so as your test numbers increase you get that bump up in the false positives so yes nope 
it's but there's no know. way to know that unless the same person tests negative again. Right. Yep. And only Cheryl's going to know that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 And I have I'm seen it. Get, yeah. I've seen a number of individuals in the news where they'll say, okay, you know, so and so is tested negative, and then I've, you know, we'll see them come back and they tested negative again. So I think maybe for some folks, they're putting in that protocol that, like, okay, let's do it again. But that's a good point. Hmm. What, um, so what does that bring our cases up to now? Our recent positive cases are up to five. Five, okay. All right. And I think our highest was around 10 at one point back in the spring, wasn't it? Nine. Was it nine? Okay. So keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Wear those masks, use that hand sanitizer, clean, do all those things. It actually does make a difference as we've seen. So. Yes. All right, thanks. Any, uh, any other updates? No other updates. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Any questions for um, Lori or anybody? All set. Um, Thanks, EMD. You're welcome. Uh, and do you, did you have any other anything related to UMass or anything, Jeff, in the updates at all? Yep, I, I had a couple of things. Um, last week we had talked about. Um, the fact that UMass was going out to Amherst apartment complexes and talking to their residents um, and they had reached out to UMass and had a conversation with them about doing something similar. They had reached out to at least one apartment complex in Sunderland and hadn't gotten a response. Um, mm -hmm. And so I set, a, set up a, a time to talk to them and said, well, how can we be helpful? How can we help facilitate these meetings? Do you want us to participate? And um, what is the plan? And I think they have different approaches for different types of apartment complexes. Um, you know, some that are more spread out, it makes sense to walk in a case like this, uh, or in a case where it's more apartment buildings and they're gonna be indoors. Typically they like to drop things off with with management um, and, and then have them delivered either at the mailboxes or something to, to spread information, but not actually walk door to door because that might not be such a good thing for <laughs> uh, right. airborne disease. So we're working on individual plans for, um, you know, the largest apartment complexes and then probably for those that we are going to be having conversations, either myself or, um, somebody from the police department or something like that would, would go along with them to provide information uh, from a, a local perspective. And I'd try and include information on, you know, how to sign up for code red alerts and other useful information that they might find um, for, for the town of Sunderland. So hopefully we'll, we'll get that wrapped up and start doing that um, in the next few weeks, but I wanted to give that update. Um, and then, so, Oh, was that just, I think it was just a radio in the background. Um, um, oh, good. I, I was going to talk about something else COVID related. So if there are more questions about uh, UMass or students or. Uh, just that, that one apartment complex we haven't heard back from yet, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. Um, so the, the two other things, one is the second round of coronavirus relief fund slash CARES Act funds are gonna be available. Uh, we need to apply uh, for our funds by October 30th. Um, and I, I believe that we are eligible for about almost two, uh, $240,000, um, and this is not like a reimbursable grant. They will give us the money up front. Um, what other communities have either done in the first round or are thinking about doing this year is just applying for the entire amount. Anything you don't spend, you have to give back, um, but this is the only other 
this is the only opportunity to apply for it. So if we don't apply for enough um, and, and we find out we have a need or things increase or a vaccine comes out that we have to pay for. Um, so I, I think that I, I would probably recommend that we, we do apply for the maximum amount um, and then any that is unspent by the end. I think the deadline to spend the funds is December 30th. Um, so just keeping in the back of our mind that if we don't spend the funds. We just return it to them, right? Yep. Um, do, do we need to take a vote by a certain date? Uh, yeah, the deadline is October so 30th. 30th. Um, so I think we have a couple more meetings. So okay. I'll put together the application is a little bit different this year, but there's a, the certification and um, I'll put together the spreadsheet based on how we spent funds uh, in the last fiscal year and, and the percentages. Um, so they somewhat approximately right, hopefully. Okay. So it sounds like we want to try to get that in as soon as we can then. It, it would seem to me, Mr. Chair, that, you know, we're, moving toward uh, the interior part of the year, right? right. And we're, we're still dealing with not just the need to be flexible, but the need to be creative. We've learned a lot over the course of the, of the year or since March, seems like a year or a hundred, depending on your perspective. <laughs> um, but there are still things that will need to be learned. And we, we are, we are uh, based on a budget that is, uh, predicated on some revenue guesstimates, in particular at the right. state level, the reduction of 20%. That does not change with this grant round. What does change is unforeseen expenses that this may cover. So I'm all for simply starting the process and, and make that application full. Yep. Yeah, I would agree. And, I, and you're right, because I think you know, the as the air conditioning season kicked in, you saw more outbreaks in the warmer climates, and now it's going to be our turn back again as it gets colder. So, we have to, we have to be in a position to be able to adapt uh, as needed. Let's hope we don't. In, right. In, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a perfect world, we'll we'll be on our our winding down. I don't believe that's the case. That's a perfect world. That said, we should be in a position to ask for any resource available. Uh, and if this application is one of those resources, then we should begin formulating that application process and be ready to sign it. Yep, I would agree a hundred percent. And then if we don't, and it's a, and yeah, we end up in that right. perfect world, we just send it back. Exactly. So yeah, that would be good. All right, yeah, if we can have that ready as soon as you can, Jeff, that'd be great. Uh, and then the, the last thing um, is the, um, Reopening plan, which I did. Yep. Saw that. Which kicked in yesterday, today? It did not today. kick in yet um, yeah. for, for a town office building. Um, oh, the town one, I'm sorry. Yeah, because I wanted to just check on two things. I think the last time we discussed it, um, while this loads, there, there was a, a request for. Um, you know, clarifying what would happen if somebody does come into uh, mm -hmm. the town office building. And that we actually added two sort of policies. One's a face covering policy. Basically everyone has to wear it unless they're exempt from wearing it as visitors. Employees have to wear it, um, except for when they're socially distant at their desk by themselves. Um, and then the other was about potential exposures and this is more what I wanted to talk about. Um, and, you know, the, the state guidance doesn't require shutting down the building and doing a deep cleaning. Um, that's what I've seen other communities do when- Yeah, that makes sense. So I just wanted to confirm that that, uh, that, that, that was agreeable to the select board, because obviously there is an expense related to doing a deep cleaning. and. Um, if we have people filling out forms, we know where they're meeting, you know, we can have a more tailored cleaning process that's, that's probably less expensive. Um, right. Focuses on your, your key areas of concern. Right. 
Um, but I, I have seen in, in the majority of communities that you just shut everything down, send everybody home, do a full building clean, yep. and then bring people back. Yep. Makes sense. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Yep. Um, are there any further questions on that? Um, I think that we were targeting sort of the week after the election. So is that November 6th, November 7th? Um, so Jeff, uh, the data side, if I could, Mr. Chair, one line of questioning. We just heard from the, yeah. from the regional district about their metrics for uh, closing back up, right? Or in our, in, I'll use this, this policy in that context. What's the metrics that says, okay, that's it. Towns around us are at X. Um, this comes from, I assume, the EMD, right? Lawyer would call up or the public health nurse would say, hey, you know, you're, you're climbing in and around. It's time to close your buildings again. And maybe that's for a future discussion, but we need to be able to make that decision relatively quickly as well mm -hmm. as communicate it to the public. I like this policy, Jeff. It's really well thought out. I've been through it a couple of times in the last couple of days. Contact tracing bit. I appreciate the deep cleaning. That makes perfect sense. The, uh, many places of employment are doing that. Um, I guess the only thing I would ask is, or is rattling around this brain of mine, would be, so when do we close back up? Or what are the triggers for closing back up? Uh, we could, if nothing else, we could at least maybe use the schools as just put that as a placeholder, sure. That's and, you know, and start with that and then see if, you know, <clears throat> you know, right, my, I'm back in the office now. We're doing the same thing. Like we have an extra deep, deeper cleaning that they do. Yep. So. Yeah, hmm. it could be a simple one line, right? We, we do this with snow days. If the schools are out, the building's closed. Yep. Pretty easy. If the school's closed, we close. It's completely in line with, with past practices. Yeah. yeah, and I just note because I scrolled through it, but you know we're still encouraging people to do as much business as they can remotely, yep. via phone calls, right. emails, Dropbox. So, um, you know that that would continue. But I think that that's a great point, and um, I'll, I'll talk to the Board of Health and, and the MD further. But I think the following the schools make makes a certain amount of sense, and see see what their opinions are on that. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, that said, I recommend the policy, recommend to adopt the policy as is presented. All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. There we go. We've got our policy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, my voice is, seems to have <clears throat> been cutting out a little bit tonight. Um, let's see. And I see that we've covered all of our new business items there and we're down to uh, next up, we've got licensing fees and we were discussing a potential reduction of some licensing fees there, right? Yeah, so um, I think at the, at the last meeting we had talked about um, potentially reducing license fees for, for bars and for all businesses that, that were similarly affected. And so I looked and uh, I think it's helpful just to go through very quickly. We have um, seven all alcohol licenses uh, at $1,400 fee, three wine and malt uh, alcohol licenses at $700, um, 20 Common Bix, $50 a piece, uh, three dance and entertainment, $50, one dance and entertainment license on Sundays, that's $50, uh, three jukebox, license, jukebox licenses at $50, and then three uh, class two used auto dealers at $60. And these are the, the select board license fees that, that you'd be able to change. So. In a normal year, we'd expect to collect about $13,330 um, from all of these fees. Uh, if we gave all, everybody except for um, the, the one non-restaurant bar, uh, a 25% reduction, um, 
then we would, uh, depending on, and then prorated the other one, depending on when they were allowed to open, we would uh, likely reduce uh, the revenue by about uh, 3,400 to 4,500, um, that range. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, again, that depends. If, if the bar is closed all year, we would lose more, Get that. more revenue. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and I think it definitely makes sense to prorate that particular category because they're not, you know, they're not even allowed to open at all. So, right. And I think that one of the things that I was thinking about over the course of the week is we would probably want to put a a floor on that too because if they're allowed yeah. to open in January, it it wouldn't, in my mind, and you may disagree, it wouldn't be fair that they would have to pay 11 twelfths of the year when we gave everybody else a 25% discount um, on their license fee. Mm -hmm. If there is that 25% across the board. Yep. So do you think the 25% across the board is equitable or are we targeting restaurants and uh, Drinking establishments that have been negatively impacted. I think, I mean, everybody's been impacted. I mean, no, no, there's no softball around that. But, you know, a, a car, a car, uh, the ability to sell a car with a type two license is a far cry different than being closed for the year, essentially. Right. To me, or, there's, there's a handful of those licenses that are, are outliers. No offense to, you know, class two car license folk, but. You know, if you, you cannot, they're, oh, it's a lot easier in my mind for them to have customers than it is to have, you know, insert, you know, name here of dining establishment that was impacted, or in this case here, a couple of, a couple of the all alcohol on site uh, licenses that are, are still closed. Right. Yeah, I would agree. <clears throat> Tom, at least you can... oh. You're muted. Tom, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand why we confuse issues sometimes. And, and the, the, the original thing was to help the businesses that were being affected. Thank I you. agree with you, Scott. I don't see how when, uh, if you're selling auto, if you're selling cars, you're selling cars. You know, right. I, I was looking specifically at restaurants that, that um, are, are at reduced capacity. Um, bar, you know, our one bar in town that has not been open for one day. Um, right. I, I, that, that, you know, I would, I would say, I, I think it's kind of a simple thing. I, I, and again, you know, in, 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 I look at the board of selectmen, we didn't take us out. We, we cut our entire salary out this year. Okay. Um, so somebody say, well, what, how are you going to pay for that? Well, take it out of the salary that we're not getting this year. Um, right. and, and, and to me, I, I don't think car, the car sales were what I was looking for. I was looking for businesses that have been affected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like a can, direct can, impact. Yep. Right. We could, we, we could reel, reel this back in and look at it and take action tonight on the food service specifically. Absolutely. Okay. And whether it's, whether it's food agree. service or, or in the case of, as you were saying, Tom, the, the one the one bar right All right food and beverages establishments that's fair, that's fair. Yeah. food and beverages yep and if someone wants to come in and argue the point then you know they can talk they can talk absolutely they can yeah. talk to us i mean you know maybe, maybe i'm missing something but you know when 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 you look at when you look at the restaurants many of the restaurants were were closed for an extended period of time and if you wanted, if you wanted to go do business, you have to change your your entire business plan, right? Right. On the fly, right. And so. you're still kind of limited in terms of your seating capacity, even if you are able to open. So you're still, right. David. Yeah. You're still right. Yeah. And not only yeah. that, but you're paying for PPEs and your right. and everything else that's involved. So, no, yep. that's very so, true. So if I, if I could, maybe this is a, a recommendation uh, straw man. Let me let me put this out there as the first pass. Uh, move to reduce the license inspection fees for 
food and beverage service establishments in town? Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, could you just say the, com the common VIC license? Yep. Um, what do you think, Scott? Yeah, common, common VIC. VIC spreads common VIC spreads across a, a bunch of spaces, though farm stands and uh, uh, retail spaces that have been able to open. And I get it, Tom. I know where you're headed. Yep. Yep. Would could we? And, and I would I would say all all, all of those. All of those businesses in town have had to had to make considerable changes and efforts yep. to do business. That's why you know I look at common vic and liquor licenses. You know the, the 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 licenses that are that that are you know I, I you know I'm not worried about a pinball machine right, right now. You know you don't have you don't have to have a pinball machine. Um, uh, that kind of stuff. You know. That's, that's why I phrased it with, uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, that's why I phrased it uh, regarding uh, food and beverage. Right. <clears throat> then we cover those categories and then bars. That's beverage. As a, yeah, as like a sub, because they would have the pro rating. Okay. Yep. Can, Jeff? I, yeah. can I ask, when you, um, so f food and beverage on site um, or regardless? Yes. No, oh, yes, on site. On site. That's really the target. Right. Because nope, if you no, had, you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from um, uh, a place I can roll in and buy a bag of potato chips and get some gas. They've right. been able to stay open, and I get it, but the on site service are the ones really impacted. Yeah, right. Okay, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing three licenses, which is on site all alcohol on site wine and malt and the associated common for those establishments yep that makes some sense my feeling is that that's that's what the goal here is it is i would agree well i think we're all on the same page there about that and the level the level of reduction there pro rate for the all alcohol and then a percentage of the other two yep So I, I think there's a, there are several establishments that have all alcohol licenses that also have common VIX and serve yep. food. Yeah. So they would be included. They would be included as being prorated. I think the proration is only for establishments that are bars only, right? The, the businesses that derive their sole income from alcohol. Right. Those would be the bars. And I think, Tom, those would be the ones prorated as they, in my yes. mind, as absolutely. they're closed. Yep. You're exactly. Right? Yep. So we'll, we'll prorate the only al alcohol on site and then percentage reduction for the other restaurants on restaurants that have alcohol or malt. Correct. Yep. And malt and liquor. Exactly. Wine and malt, excuse me. And what percentage? Jeff, you recommended 25%? Um, that, that was what's being discussed in, in other communities. I think Hadley was talking about 25%. Uh, that's what we had talked about last week. Yeah, and I looked through that list. That seemed to be a, a reasonable target based on- You, you know, I, and, and I, I just like to go one step further about why mm -hmm. It, it it was very it was very important that it, we had to listen to what it, you know people people don't realize a lot what some of our businesses not not some many of our businesses do to the community every single day they don't understand how much how, and 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 believe it or not there there's many of our businesses they don't want and and it goes counter counterintuitive they don't want to bring attention to themselves they just do the right thing day after day when you look. When you go to the basketball tournament and you look at the uh, the you know the, the the winter basketball tournament and you look at the 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 rosters for all the players' names, well, all of those businesses inside there contributed two hundred two hundred and fifty dollars a piece for for that that thing. Not not and that doesn't include a lot of the stuff that they give that they don't you know people that never they never ever ever see. So that's true. 
I, they, they're, they're, and, and, and this is just a small token from the town of Sunderland, the residents of the town of Sunderland say we understand. We, we voted CPA money to people that rent apartments to help pay for their, their uh, rent. Right. What's the difference? It's analogous, yep. sure. Exactly. This is just a, this is just a try. I, I, and I don't understand why, why, why any, well, any sane person would think it's a bad idea. Sure. I, I, I just think it's, it's just a, it's a, a small, a small token and, and you're talking $3,000 off to our, our potential. And, and you know what, they're, they're going to go out and they're, they're going to buy new equipment and stuff like that. And they'll probably end up paying more than that 3000 per in personal property tax. So. Sure. Yeah. Especially with equipment costs these days. Right. So. Yeah. <clears throat> and like so, you said, you know, our, our cut in salary will definitely cover that <laughs> revenue gap. So. Yep. So my motion would be to prorate the on-site all alcohol with no food and then to reduce by 30% the remaining licenses that are food and alcohol on site uh, to help out these businesses that have been working um, so hard uh, over the over the course of the year. Exactly. Now this is this is without I want to make sure this is not setting a precedent. I want to make sure that it's understood that you know businesses can if they feel they're out of the category can reach out and we can talk. But right now this. As we look at this annual inspection cycle and the applications, these do these fees are coming going to be coming due soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, Jeff. Can Second. I suggest for the um, business that derives its sole income from alcohol that it's a minimum of thirty percent and then prorated beyond that? And and again, it's because if they're allowed to open in January or February, they might. And it's just straight prorated. That's only. That's not a third of the year. You know, it's not thirty percent of the year. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right, right, right. If the timing is such, them. no. Good point, right. Jeff. That's fine. Yep. That's fine. Yep. Good All point. Right. Good, good motion, Scott. I. Yep. All right. So all, all in favor of the motion as amended. Aye. 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 All right. And it, that kind of reminds me about like um, on the precedent side, I'm hoping that um, everybody everywhere learns from this and, and takes into account um, outdoor seating and things like that. I think we've kind of given short shrift to that on a normal basis. And hopefully um, this will kind of make us think a little bit more about that on a regular ongoing basis. <clears throat> I think a lot of people have actually enjoyed that aspect of it. So Hopefully it'll be a little more of that going forwards. <clears throat> All righty. <clears throat> and I see next on our item is department head scheduling. We're going to try to get back to um, scheduling our department heads to come in periodically for um, some updates. Oh, look at that. There's a suggested like schedule. Yeah, so I... Um, but took the helpful feedback from last meeting and thought about the times that made sense to me and wanted to run that by everyone. Um, you know, and, and you know, one, one of the really helpful things was people are gonna come in to present their budgets, you know, January through March. Um, so I tried to focus on, on the other, mm -hmm months of the year and, and yep. what seemed to make sense. Yep. Um, and yeah, this makes sense. I think in our prior discussion, maybe it was you and I on the phone, Jeff, talking about you know, having a reporting frequency that for the sake of reporting and not necessarily covering new ground didn't make any sense with everybody's schedule the way it is. I like this format, right? You get peaks of preview and then conclusions of work. Uh, you get a little bit of the outdoor piece and some new residents come September, you know, fire prevention week is aligned. August and June makes perfect sense for schools. I like it. Yep. A causal schedule makes sense. Excellent. And obviously as things come up. Yeah, we can. Change, we can always, but I'll, I'll start plugging those in. Um, Probably 
Well, we already had the town clerk, so. There you go. Have the next right. meeting. A move to adopt the schedule for the coming year and then to assess in one year. Excellent. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and, and eventually, once we get like a calendar up there, sure, point two, we can get it up on that, you know, and then have that linked out there. So that'll, that'll be a, a nice place that everybody can go in and look at it, which will be good. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Um, and we've got our placeholder for discussions of benchmarks. Um, I don't know that we've gotten anything new yeah. this week. So I think we're still kind of targeting end of the month around there. So there is, there is going to be a, a state budget finance uh, hearing, economic roundtable like they did a few months ago. And I think that's on Wednesday. So I'll participate in that and hopefully have some information to share at the next meeting. Yeah. All right, so keep our fingers crossed there. <clears throat> and the better uh, the caseload is, the better it'll be for everybody, so, <clears throat> and the economy. Um, so next up, we have got uh, any select board updates? I don't have any, Mr. Chair. Okay, all right. Um, how about town administrator updates? Anything else besides all the other stuff that we've got? <laughs> <laughs> very, very briefly, um, the Life Path received a grant to do uh, regional age-friendly communities. Uh, a few months ago, um, you all signed a, a letter of support for creating Sunderland as an age-friendly community. And we're looking at either a county-wide uh, regional designation or perhaps uh, a more local one, either um, doing it ourselves or doing it with Deerfield and Waitley because of the shared senior center. Um, and so we just had a, a preliminary discussion today. And then I think the Council on Aging is participating in a similar discussion uh, later this week. And then uh, I'm going to follow up with them and see if they have a preference for for how that goes, but I just wanted to mention that that's the latest on the age-friendly community designation. Okay, all right. And if there was a preference from, from the board that, that we go at it by ourselves or if it was better to do it regionally or um, if you had any preliminary thoughts or. No, my feeling is that when we've gone after regional, whether it's hazard mitigation or DHCD or you know, all that. It's really important to look at it from a outside of your own borders and with our neighbors approach, in my mind. Okay. Yep. I, I would agree with that regional has, has benefited us overall pretty much a, everything we've done. A reconstituted Council of Aging. You got some really wonderful people working really hard and you put that into the form of a network and it's much more powerful. Yep. I would agree. Yep, we've had our best luck there when you look at like the, um, the emergency services and everything else. We're, we're not big enough to really stand on our own right. and make a, a big difference resource wise. So and it's, I think at this point I'd have to be convinced to not go regionally. And if you look at the success of the South County Senior Center and mm -hmm. its, its origin and its development, you know, maybe it's a South County approach or maybe it's a county wide approach. Depends on some of the, yeah. in, some of the elements of the, of the program itself. Right. And I know, um, I think it was Ben who touched on it. I know we had, I wasn't able to get to it. I wish I could have, um, but they had the uh, flu clinic and that seemed to go pretty well from what I heard. So I didn't know if anybody else had heard anything about it, but that was a, a good thing. <clears throat> good exercises. Yep, exactly. Cause it, it, in my mind, all of this, uh, and everything we've been going through for COVID really should be a, a sort of a dry rehearsal for, you know, if we ever, God forbid, get into a really serious thing that's even worse than COVID, you know, we should be learning from this entire experience. So it's all about <clears throat> practicing, Mr. Chair. Practice, practice, practice. That's, that's what I hear. Um, Thanks for the comments, John. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, now we have certification of housing production plan is our last item on our regularly scheduled program. Yes, so um, 
the housing production plan, I think uh, there was a request for certification um, based on the North 116 Flats project, um, but it wasn't certified. And I don't believe that uh, the town ever resubmitted for certification based on 120 North Main Street. And we were advised last week that that we could and probably should do that. Um, and so we just drafted a, a similar letter seeking recertification. Uh, okay. And and that would, I think certification um, to provides two years, two years of um, certification, and then we'd have to get recertified based mm -hmm. on the number of affordable units we've produced. Yeah, because they periodically check that. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, do you need a motion for that or just a letter? Um, Move to sign the letter and submit. All right. We have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor of signing the letter and submitting? Aye. 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 <clears throat> All right. Thank you. And now we've reached the exciting public comment portion of the evening. I don't know if anybody's got any other general public comments at all tonight. We've covered a pretty good swath of ground, I know, so far. So, <clears throat> a lot going on. I know, I know. Not to mention the football game tonight with a different quarterback. So, <laughs> there's no NFL bubble. So, um, if there's no public comment, can you just scroll down just a little bit on there, Jeff, for a sec? So I can pull, there we go. Thank you. Our other important dates to remember. <clears throat> We've got Columbus Day, in which we're typically closed, Monday, October 12th. And our next meeting, rather than being Monday the 12th, since it's closed, will be Tuesday, October 13th. Um, should be our regularly scheduled time at 6.30, so. Yes, they um, do, John. Yeah. <laughs> that is very true, or and good smoothies. Um, and our hazard mitigation plan public forum will be Tuesday, October 13th at 7 p.m. and during that meeting. So if you're at all interested in our hazard mitigation plan, uh, come on down. And, and any a public input would be appreciated because you never know there might be something that in a lot of our past meetings we haven't thought of yet or looked at. So, And also so, just to uh, be informed. So in that announcement, Mr. Chair, I see our next hmm. meeting date is the 13th. Is our starting time 6.30 again? I, I believe it is, right, Jeff? We think we've just got the hazard mitigation at seven, so. Got it, just in case there's <clears throat> business to conduct. Yeah, exactly, yep. Very good, thank you. So, um, and I think that is about it for tonight, so. And remember, if you've got any questions about voting, please don't hesitate to check out our website or contact Wendy in the town clerk's office. She's been doing a great job so far, hustling about with all those armfuls of ballots and everything, so uh, things are looking pretty good here. So, um, and thanks to everybody who's been pitching in. It's been an envelope stuffing frenzy here today. So, um, do we have a motion to adjourn then? Motion. I'll second. All right. All those in favor of adjourning at 7.50 p.m.? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. <laughs>